All right, so at the end of the last video, we talked about a theorem uh, with two, um, two kind of basic properties of linearly independent and linearly dependent sets. We said that if a set contains the zero vector, then it's automatically going to be linearly dependent. And we also said uh, for part B of that theorem, if a set contains exactly two vectors, um, and one vector is a scalar multiple of the other, then it's also going to be linearly dependent. Now what we're going to do here is sort of generalize part B of that theorem to a set that doesn't necessarily contain exactly two vectors, but can contain any number of vectors. So this theorem says that if we have a set, uh, again we're going to call it S, of the vectors V1 through Vn, and if any one of the vectors in this set can be written as a linear combination of the other vectors in that set, then the set is linearly dependent. In fact, uh, this is an if and only if statement. This set is linearly dependent if and only if one of these vectors can be written as a linear combination of the others. So <clears throat> this is a, a useful um, a useful way of uh, understanding linear dependence. And in fact, I think your book e even defines linear dependence this way. Um, we've defined it a different but equivalent way. So uh, let's let's prove this and then look at an example where we get to use it. Going this direction first, let's suppose that S is that set that we talked about, V1 through Vn, and it's linearly dependent. Then by our definition of linear dependence, there exists some set of scalars K1 through Kn, and not all of them will be zero, such that this linear combination is equal to the zero vector. The, and it only takes one of them to be non-zero for, for this to be a linearly dependent set. Now, here's a term you haven't seen me use yet, but this is actually very common in mathematical proof. Um, the terms, or the, the phrase, without loss of generality. Um, some, some proofs you'll actually see it abbreviated, W-L-O-G. Um, and what it means here, uh, well, let's, let's read the whole sentence. Without loss of generality, assume that K1 is not equal to zero. Now, the, the statement says there exists some set of scalars uh, such uh, or K1 through Kn, not all of which are zero. It doesn't say which one is necessarily non-zero. But uh, if I just assume that it's K1 that's the non-zero scalar, and then uh, if I'm able to prove my theorem uh, from that, I don't need to then go back and say, well, what if it was K2 that was non-zero? And what if it was K3 that's non-zero? And consider all n cases, because the proof would be essentially identical in every single one of those cases, just with some small changes in subscripts. So rather than uh, get too nitty gritty as far as that goes, it's very common to use this without loss of generality statement. Um, that said, you have to be really careful when you use it because it's not always appropriate to use that when you might think it is. Here, however, we can use that statement. So we're going to assume that it's k1 that's not equal to 0. Now, if that were the case, um, I could isolate v1 in this linear combination that's equal to 0. I could subtract each of the uh, other terms over to the left-hand side. And then here's where we're using the fact that k1 is not equal to 0. If k1 is non-zero, I can divide by it, OK? because Anything that's non-zero can be used as a divisor. So if I divide both sides by k1, which is the same thing as multiplying both sides by 1 over k1, my linear combination on the right-hand side will end up looking like this. Okay, And you should be able to see algebraically why this will simplify to this without having to write all the steps in between. But what does that actually tell me? Well, because... Uh, because this right-hand side now looks like a linear combination of V2 through Vn, and it's equal to V1, that's saying the thing that we were trying to prove. One of the vectors in our set S can be written as a linear combination of the other vectors in S. So that proves that direction. Going the other direction, let's suppose that uh, there's some vector in S that uh, can be written as a linear combination of the others. And again, without loss of generality, we'll just assume that V1 is the vector we're talking about. Um, let's say V1 is equal to C2, V2, plus all this stuff in between, plus C and Vn. So <clears throat> uh, what is the goal here? We want to show that our set is linearly dependent if this is true. And that's easy to do, because now we just subtract all of these terms over to the left, and if you notice what's left, we have a linear combination of all n vectors in the set S, and it's equal to the zero vector. 
if we want to show linear dependence for that set of vectors, then we need to somehow uh, assure ourselves that not all of these scalars are equal to zero. I don't know anything about the scalars C2 through Cn, but I do know that the, the uh, uh, coefficient on this v1 is a 1, not a 0. So because the coefficient on one of these terms is non-zero, that's where we get linear dependence from, and that proves this theorem. Okay. Now this is a useful theorem in cases where we want to confirm whether a set is linearly uh, dependent or independent, because it can be, um, it can actually make uh, make things a little bit easier. Uh, in some cases when we have to check for that uh, linear independence or linear dependence. So let me give you an example of what I'm talking about here. I have a set of three vectors in R3, and I want to determine whether these three, this set of vectors is linearly independent or dependent. So I could uh, do what we've done before, create an arbitrary linear combination, set it equal to zero, turn that into a homogeneous linear system, and then use the techniques that we've developed with matrices and whatnot to determine whether or not that will have a non-trivial solution or not. Um, but let's, let's take a different approach. So I want to see if there's a way to write one of these vectors as a linear combination of the other two. And let's just pick the first two and see if I can create a linear combination to make this one. So uh, I noticed that I have a 1 and a 3 here. If I were to multiply this first vector by negative 2, that would put a negative 2 here, plus this 3 would give me a 1. So if I did negative 2 times the vector 1, 0, negative 1, plus 1 times, I'm not going to write the 1, 3, 1, 2, I can see that my uh, first component in this, in whatever this comes out to, is going to be a 1. And then here I'm going to get a 0 plus a 1, that's a 1. And here, negative 2 times negative 1, that's 2, plus 2, that's 4. Notice that the third vector in this set, I was able to write as a linear combination of the other two. That means that we have linear dependence. I'm just going to abbreviate that LD. Okay? So... You don't always want to try that approach when you're trying to prove linear uh, dependence or independence. For one thing, if the set is linearly independent, you're going to be trying all sorts of things and you're not going to get anywhere. Um, because by, by this theorem, if the set was linearly independent, then none of these vectors could be written as a linear combination of the others. But also, even if it is linearly dependent, especially in sets that have more than three vectors, it can be really difficult to figure out how to create a linear combination that equals one of those vectors. So um, it's not a surefire technique, but in some special cases, it's a, it's a quicker way to, to, uh, to determine that. All right, um, so on this page, I wanna look at a geometric interpretation of linear independence. And my printer has started running out of uh, colored toners, so you're gonna have a hard time seeing this. However, this, this image is in your book, so you'll wanna to refer to your book. Um, this is uh, a theorem that we can make sense of in light of the theorems that we just proved. So I know it's hard to see this one, but what we're looking at here uh, in these first two pictures is um, uh, the graph of a line through the origin in three space. Now remember, lines through the origin are subspaces, and uh, what's kind of difficult to see here are the are two vectors, v1 and v2, both on that line. Notice that if v1 and v2 are on the same line, then one would have to be a scalar multiple of the other. That means the set containing those two vectors would be linearly dependent, based on that theorem that we did at the end of the last video. So uh, similar here, these two vectors are pointing in opposite directions, and that would still mean that v1 and v2 are scalar multiples of each other, it's just the scalar will be negative instead of positive. So in either of these cases, we're seeing that uh, in the case of a set of two vectors in R3, if that set of vectors is linearly dependent, then what that implies is that the two vectors lie on the same line, or in other words, they are collinear. So geometrically, that's how we understand linear dependence in R3, in three space, and in two space as well, actually. Um, two vectors are, a set of two vectors are linearly independent if and only if they are collinear.
So that's just a restating of that last that, that previous theorem. These two vectors, again, I know it's hard to see here, but refer to your book, linearly independent uh, because they are not collinear. Um, they have different directions, and so one could not be a scalar multiple of the other. Therefore, two vectors in R3 are linearly independent if they are not collinear. Down here, um, again, difficult to see, but I'll kind of explain what we're looking at. Uh, we have vectors that, uh, we're looking at three vectors now. Okay, so we would have to use the theorem that we just proved to talk about these. Um, remember what it means for uh, a, a vector to be, or sorry, for um, a set to be linearly dependent based on that last theorem is that one vector in the set can be written as a linear combination of the other two. So for example, if I have uh, vectors v1, v2, and v3, and one of those vectors is uh, parallel to the other, then they're collinear. And so based on the same logic that we saw up here, we would have linear dependence. But even if all three vectors are non-collinear, but they simply lie all in the same plane, Remember, that would imply that one of those vectors could be written as a linear combination of the other two. We proved that back in chapter 3, and we've mentioned it again since then, um, that a plane can be determined by two non-collinear vectors if you look at all linear combinations of those. So let's, again, hard to see, but V1 and V2 here are non-collinear, and if V3 can be written as a linear combination of those two, meaning V3 is just any other vector in that plane, then uh, this would have to be those three vectors would have to form a linearly dependent set. So in the case of three vectors in R three, uh, the set of th those those three vectors will be linearly dependent if they are coplanar, if all three of them lie in the same plane. This again difficult to see, but this is a linearly independent case where two of the vectors lie in the same plane and the other one is not in the plane. It's kind of coming out of the plane somehow. So in this case, that would not determine a linearly dependent set. So three non-coplanar vectors in R3 determines a linearly independent set. It's helpful to have the geometric intuition behind what we're talking about. All right, here's another theorem. And again, the, the proof for this one I uh, copied out of the book uh, just because I, I, I thought it was written well enough in there and I would use that to save some time. But again, because the color in my printer is running out, it didn't come out all that easy to read. So I'll try, I'll try and help explain what's going on here. Um, <clears throat> now let, let's suppose we're looking at a set S of vectors, but specifically vectors that are in N space. So we're in Rn specifically here. And let's suppose that we have R vectors in total, V1 through Vr. Um, then that set of vectors, uh, oh, and let's suppose that R is greater than N. Okay, so in other words, the uh, number of vectors in this space is larger than the n that determines this n space. If that's the case, then S is automatically linearly dependent. So we're going to prove this in a second, but basically what this means is if I gave you a question, let's see if I did one like this. Okay, um, this isn't a great example, but it's something I can point to. These, these vectors here are in R3, right? And the set contains three vectors. Um, but let's suppose we didn't know, we didn't figure this out. We didn't figure out that this is a linear, linearly dependent set. If I had one additional vector in here, so four total, I wouldn't have to do anything. I can say automatically that has to be a linearly dependent set because there's more than three vectors and all of the vectors are from R3, okay? Um, let's prove this one. This is a, we're gonna kind of generalize this in the next section when we talk about dimension. Or, I'm sorry, that's that's two sections away when we talk about dimension. Um, <clears throat> all right. So because all, four, uh, all R of these vectors are in Rn, I can put them in the form of something that looks like a vector from Rn, you know, uh, ordered n-tuple. So V1, we're going to define this way. V2 is going to look like this. Here's Vr and, you know, all of the ones in between. So what's the goal here? Well, again, we wanted to uh, assume that this R is larger than this n and we want to show that this set of R vectors forms a linearly dependent set. And by our definition, the way that we do that, 
is we create a linear combination of those r vectors, set it equal to zero, and then try to somehow show that at least one of the scalars, the k's here, is non-zero. Okay, now what this is going to do is it's going to naturally lead to a system of equations which I have here on the next page. And because these are on two different pages, it might be a little bit difficult to see where we get this one from the last one. So let me go back here really quick. Remember, what you're doing here is you're uh, creating a linear combination of each of these vectors and setting it equal to the zero vector in Rn. But the zero vector in Rn looks like an n-tuple with n zeros in it. So if I take the first component of this, add it to the first component of this, add it to the first component of the next one, and do that all the way through, then all of those R first components should add up to zero. And that's what this first equation here says. Um, and the rest of these come from doing the same thing with the remaining components in those, in those vectors, okay? Now, as complicated as this looks, we have a theorem that allows us to deal with this because think about how many equations and how many unknowns there are. We have R unknowns because the unknowns are the Ks, and we have K1 through Kr. But we only have N equations because each equation corresponds to one of the components in a vector from Rn. And again, we assumed that R was greater than N. In other words, we have more unknowns than we